Hi, this is Steve Hargadon, and welcome to the Future of Education. It is March 20th, 2012, and our guest tonight is Kathy Davidson, author of Now You See It. Kathy, thanks so much for being here. It's great to be here. Thanks, Steve. Hope you feel okay about that picture. It was my favorite of the bunch. The the, uh, the author photo with the iPod. I love. I, I quite like that. I um, um yes. Yeah. Fun. The Future of Education is a Web 2.0 Labs project. These are activities that um, we do that try and create opportunities for conversation amongst educators, teachers, and learners. Web20labs.com. We appreciate the support of Blackboard Collaborate. They provide this terrific room, and it's much appreciated. Coming up at ISTE this year, for the fifth year in a row, our Unplug schedule, which starts with the all-day unconference on Saturday, which previously has been called EduBloggerCon and is now being rebranded as Social EdCon. This is a free event. You don't even need to be registered for ISTE to come. It is just a blast. We hope that if you're in the San Diego area or you're planning to go to ISTE, that you will consider joining us that day. Lots of other activities, uh, probably Saturday night in that incubator session. We know Sunday we're going to have a global education unconference for those who've participated in that virtual conference the last couple of years. We do have the Bloggers Cafe. Lots, lots of fun. Go to um, ISTEUnplugged.com. And also, we're celebrating the fifth anniversary of Classroom 2.0. A couple of fun things we're doing, one of which is a, a project for PBS NewsHour around a teacher council. They're our first test case of the Ed Incubator project, as well a Classroom 2.0 fifth anniversary book. Tremendous submission so far. Every submission will get published online. We're going to take the ones that are most popular and put them in a physical book, but this should really be a blast. Go to classroom20.com and click on the book up at the top menu. Coming up on our virtual conferences this year, uh, we have a social learning summit on April 21st. This is free. It's being sponsored by Discovery Education. We're still taking submissions for proposals, sociallearningsummit.com, or go to classroom20.com, and you'll see the ads there. Uh, this should be a lot of fun. It's a Saturday event all around social media, Web 2.0, and learning. Uh, for the second year, we're doing our Future of Libraries conference, thanks to San Jose State University. That's October 3rd through the 5th. Last year, we had over 7,000 and the people. Uh, just a blast. Uh, great set of keynotes coming up. Can't wait to uh, do it again. And the third year of our Global Education Conference, if you haven't participated, the five-day mothership virtual event, four to five hundred sessions, people from everywhere in the world, just a blast. We have got a commitment to do a gaming and education conference, thanks to Brain Pop, will be coming up. And then we're going to do a conference on alternate education. Uh, and we'll give dates for those as we get them. Coming up on the Future of Education, David Warlick uh, on Thursday night, uh, Alec Koros uh, next week on social learning, Dick Gale on appreciative inquiry and positive deviance in schools, Howard Rheingold on his new book, Net Smart. Uh, lots there. If you've seen this list before, the newest one is... We have Michael from Skillshare coming on, but I think there was another one. Oh, Richie Norton is going to come on. He's published an ebook called Resumes Are Dead and what to do about it. Just really excited to have him on and talk about that and talk about the personal web profile and sort of authentic student representation on the web. If you've missed any of the, our shows, they are, are all up on futureofeducation.com in full Illuminate versions plus in MP3 format. Mimi Ito last week, really a delightful conversation with her. We had a panel on Seth Godin's Stop Stealing Dreams book, David Weinberger before that. Um, on Too Big to Know, Dennis Litke on Big Picture Schools. Anyway, hopefully there's something there that you'll find interesting. So this is where we let you tell us where you're participating from. Look to the left of the map. You're looking for some icons. The second one down is a star. You have to click it twice. But then once you do so, you can put your star on the map. It's also lots of fun for you to post in the chat. Give a shout out for where you're participating from, maybe the time and the temperature. Always fun to see Australia. The trees think it's May in New Jersey. Yes, we had snow this weekend in Park City. Of course, we're desperately in need of the snow, and it's going to be in the low 60s later in the week.
wherever you're listening from, we are sure glad to have you here. And if you're listening to the recording, thanks so much for taking the time. So, Kathy, uh, uh, before we actually get into the interview, what I'd like to do is to show the uh, video that really, one of the videos that the uh, sort of the basis for the thesis of the book. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. And I'm going to put it up right now. Do you want to give any kind of an intro before we show it? Be sure to turn your mic back on. So Kathy, I'm wondering if you want to do any kind of an intro before we show the video. Hi, um, I, I'm sorry, I was, un I was muted. Um, sure, the intro was, this, this experiment was originally done in the 1970s by the great founder of cognitive psychology, um, Ulrich Nieser, and um, people thought it was going to revolutionize our idea of the brain. Well, it didn't, and people said the problem was the technology. So in 1999, two graduates, a graduate student and a young assistant professor, Dan Simons and Chris Chabris, redid it. And with the very much the same results. And um, I think what we're going to be looking at is the second one, um, the second version of this. And uh, the assignment is watch and count how many times the ball is passed only between people wearing black. The basketball is passed between people wearing black. So in this new version, I actually believe it's the people wearing white. But they'll tell us. Okay, so. let's count the people wearing white. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to put it up. It's going to pull up in YouTube on your screens. It's a. Uh, it's less than two minutes long. We'll give a few extra seconds after it's over. If it for some reason doesn't pull up for you or you're behind a firewall, we'll put the link and you can watch it later. And Kathy, you can turn your mic off. I think. Okay, Kathy, so we showed the second video in case there was someone who had seen the first. And essentially, for me, this is really sort of the core of the book. It's not just that uh, there is something called attention blindness, but that this has huge implications for how we think about a transition in time from uh, a period of certain habits and patterns serving us well and then having a really hard time seeing that they don't serve us anymore because we're still so focused on the original thing we were looking at. So is that how you give, give us your encapsulation of the, the, the invisible grill as it relates to the theme of the book? Sure. I mean, the visible gorilla happens, uh, works on a uh, neurological level, but it also works on a metaphoric one. On a neurological level, basically the, the way we pay attention to the world is by focusing, and it's a wonderful, wonderful ability of the human brain to shut out extraneous material and just focus on the problem or the thing that's grabbing our attention at the time. Um, as that wonderful video shows, um, when you're focusing on one thing, literally you cannot see uh, other things until you're distracted. So metaphorically, what I basically say is distraction is our friend. Uh, because in many situations, you know, if you're just counting the, the basketballs and missing the gorilla, you're in trouble. And uh, the method I advocate um, in Now You See It and in my nonprofit Haystack is something we call collaboration by difference, which basically is, hey, you count, I'll keep an eye on that gorilla. That in other words, it's impossible for any one human brain to pay attention to everything at once. But with the right tools, the right partners, and the right methods, in fact, we can see in different ways. Um, the historical part that I think um, you were referring to is, is really, really interesting. Interesting, and that's, we know in different cultures and at different time periods in our own culture that um, sometimes we're better at counting basketballs and sometimes we're better at, um, at, at seeing the scary thing, the gorilla, and um, those things change over time um, because what we're interested in uh, changes over time. It's why a two-year-old can often work an iPad better than a 
a 60-year-old. Um, you start creating patterns of behavior and of cognition and of memory and of attention. And once you have those, those patterns, they become more and more fluid and easy. And we would say natural. Well, they're not natural at all. They're learned. And the downside of those fluid, natural, easy, learned uh, habits that make so, life so easy is you're excluding everything else. You're, you're missing a lot of gorillas. So um, I actually advocate a method of distra distraction that prevents you from doing the count successfully in order to see the gorilla or a method of sharing so that you can divide up the tasks and have a better uh, possibility of seeing the big picture. So, Kathy, for me, the, 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 I felt the book was brilliant. We'd had the authors of The Invisible Gorilla on the show, and I, you know, I had made a lot of connections, but I hadn't made the sort of bigger connection to the idea of our focusing on certain things culturally. Um, but for me, there were two tensions that ran throughout the book. Uh, one of those tensions was that, that this is a transition so, so both the old and new cultures are kind of competing, and both are rewarded in different ways. And it feels like a lot of the dialogue, especially about education reform, reflects those two different competing visions. The other tension for me was the tension between whether this is a new story or an old story. And I almost felt like you kind of vacillated in the book that this is not new. Anytime there's a big change, that we do see things, we do. Um, find ourselves focusing on things that are not helpful anymore. But I also felt like you were saying the internet is a really big change. So uh, are, do those two tensions exist within you, or did I just read them into the book? Well, I think those are the two tensions of our moment. And I think that you, uh, that's really perceptive that you said that. And I'm, I'm, I'll talk about both of them for a little bit, because I think they're really key. Um, on the one hand, we are at a transitional moment. And what a transitional moment means when there's a huge paradigm shift or a, an episteme shift, we become aware of habits. And that's, you know, that's why we're all so obsessed with multitasking. You know, there's really no such thing as, as monotasking. The brain doesn't know how to monotask. But once we're aware of our habits, we're aware of things as tasks instead of things as just what we do without thinking about them. So um, basically, anytime we think we're multitasking, all that means is things that patterns that we would normally do automatically we're, are, are surface for us and we're dismayed or distracted or upset that we're not behaving as automatically as, as possible. So that's, that's a cognitive, habitual behavior change that happens in any transitional moment. And um, the second thing you talked about was um, same old, same old. Everything that's new has happened before. I actually think Bob Darton is right, that in all of human history, with all of the times when we've gone through technolo technological change, and technological change always makes us feel distracted and become, makes us aware of our own habits. But he says there have really only been four huge changes in the way we convey information and the way we, we react. Um, and interact with one another from the beginnings. And that's writing, movable type, mass printing, and the internet, which basically happened in April of 1993 when the Mosaic 1.0 browser um, uh, becomes public. So I would say it's a both and rather than either or. And I mean both tensions. On the one hand, any change, and that can be things like you began this program by saying you fell, you fell and you um, you hurt your arm recently, which I talk about in the book, too. That kind of change suddenly makes you aware of patterns that you were taking for granted. Um, once you can't use your, an arm that you've depended on, you have to use the rest of your body in different ways. You start wor seeing a world in which disability, people with disabilities have tremendous obstacles that you don't see because your patterns haven't been changed. But once your patterns are changed, all of those tasks, all of those obstacles become very, very apparent. What I'm also, so that's true from anything. It's true, sadly, it's often true in um, things like moments of great loss, uh, emotional disturbance, when the world suddenly looks very different because all you're really seeing is you're seeing the world through the, the cloud of your loss. Um, but right now, as a culture, as a world, we're going through this major change. So we're all feeling a little dislocated at the same time because of the drastically new expectations, 
requirements, opportunities, and challenges of the information age that we're living in. So yes, it's, it's true on the smaller level, and it's also true on this huge, huge paradigm shifting um, level of the information age that we live in. So if our brains are wired for activity, for being uh, attentive, for making connections, um, for being attracted to uh, attention, um, uh, what are the implications for that uh, as we think about things like flow? So does, is flow a positive or a negative in this view? Um, well, it's a little, again, it's a little bit of both. It depends on what you're doing. Flow is, you know, we crave flow, whether you're a gamer or dancing. Is, is, um, uh, I'm going to botch his name. Just, um, you probably can fill in for me. What is um name? I know that's, I've really just done a bad job of it. Um, but um, he says brain, performing brain surgery, dancing to rock music, and I would add gaming and many other things that are so, we're so absorbed in them, we don't pay attention to anything else. Well, that's a wonderful thing for accomplishing the thing we're absorbed in. It also means we don't know, um, we don't notice anything else. Um, my um, husband loves to joke that when I'm in a very busy, crowded place and I'm concentrated on something, whether it's blogging or answering an email, the whole world could fall apart, and I don't see it. I'm one of those people who's pretty good at sh shutting out the outside world. Um, I've sat in my car uh, on my BlackBerry answering somebody's urgent message and looked up and realized the parking lot that used to be crowded is now empty. It was day, now it's night, and I didn't notice any of those things. Well, that's a good thing as far as answering the urgent email that might have avoided a catastrophe. It, there's possibly negative consequences to suddenly being alone in a dark parking lot with nobody around you. I mean, you know, so it's always a both and. And what I'm saying is we, as with all binaries, it's really important um, to see the other side. In fact, the book ends with a famous Japanese proverb that means the reverse side itself always has a reverse side. And that's not the same as two sides of the same coin because it says you turn the reverse side it has a reverse side. You turn that side, it has a reverse side. Um, I think that's true of learning disabilities, of focus, of attention, of the historical age we live in. It works on, again, on a neurological level, but also on the broadest cultural level. So. And incidentally, my theory of learning is that learning always happens in those moments of distraction, in those moments when we become aware of our pattern. Because uh, it's awareness that allows us to learn. So it's seems like it's not a uh, surprise then that, that you who had some unrecognized or undiagnosed difficulties in learning have seen this because it would feel as though this kind of a perspective on life and culture and specifically on education benefited from your being a little bit on the outside. Yeah. I mean, you know, I'm I'm um, one of those people, and I now have this whole world of people that are telling me, yeah, I was an adult when I was di diagnosed with learning disabilities, too. It turns out a lot of us were. Um, I'm one of those people who was just grumpy and obstinate through school my whole life because it didn't make sense to me. There were always things that I thought were simplistic or... Um, just wrong or that I couldn't do. Um, I was very, very lucky though because really early on as a um, really um, pre-kindergartner had been uh, diagnosed through some testing as having some uh, unusually positive math abilities. So instead of me just being learning disabled, I was very lucky because I was very soon selected out for lots of different stuff in the math world. Well, a lot of my kids and my friends who went to math camp with me also had very eccentric ways of do dealing with the world. But at the time, we were just considered math geeks. We weren't considered learning disabled. It was really when I was 27 and went uh, with the daughter of a friend of mine to have her uh, reading issues um, addressed that I had any idea that I was in the top 1% of dyslexics, that I'm way on the edge in terms of dyslexia. And I've often wondered if my life would have been different if at age three I had been labeled not like a math, you know, gifted in math, but disabled. Uh, it could have been, a, you know, it, it could have been a very, very different life if I'd gone through life um, compensating for disability rather than sort of 
I wouldn't say arrogant, but certainly feisty and obstinate and, uh, uh, you know, uh, reinforced in my eccentric way of, lo of looking at the world. It's, um, uh, entrepreneurs are four times more likely than the general population to have learning disabilities. And I think there's some feistiness and some um, seeing the world as always an opportunity for a workaround that encourages entrepreneurship. Now we've talked on this show about how many parents end up being told that their child is defective in our current system and how harmful that seems to be. Yes, right now we're in an, I think it's an epidemic of diagnosis and I think there's a reason for that and this is the gorilla experiment again. We, you know, if Galileo or da Vinci or um, somebody from uh, Newton had been told that in the 21st century we would think the pinnacle of intelligence is correctly filling in items on a bubble test, A, B, C, D thinking, one best answer thinking, they would have thought the lemmings had gone over the cliff, that, the human, that humans had just gone crazy. And of course, that is our standard for um, every kind of testing worldwide, except in Finland, and I'm happy to talk about Finland. Um, but. Um, it's a narrow, very, very narrow cast way of testing and assessing intelligence. And I think there's a reason why the more we emphasize one best answer testing, the more the epidemic of learning disabilities grows. Because what that means is you're focusing more and more on how to do the right answer, how to focus, how to count those basketballs, and you're missing all different other forms of attention, the, the different ways of of learning that are so important to our world, artistic learning, creative wor wor learning, the way the inventive problem solving learning of the engineer, all of those kinds of learning are very, very different than the choosing the best answer from four that is now our national, the, our international standard of learning. I think there's, there, it's a flip side. It's with everything with the gorilla experiment, it's a flip side. You know, I was particularly interested in your discussion of uh, multitasking and the Stanford study in particular, which I had, like everyone else, I think, read as those who think they're the best multitaskers are actually the worst at it. And uh, what you helped me to see was that, in fact, um, oftentimes in my multitasking, I feel very productive not necessarily because of either of the two tasks, but because of connections that my brain is making between the two subjects. Is, is that a fair entree into that topic? It's perfect. You said that. I, I want to put that in a little under glass because that's exactly right. And precisely what that form of testing um, in Cliff's, uh, Cliff Nass's experiment doesn't test is connection. Um, there's a counter experiment that was actually done in Melbourne. I see we have some people on from Australia, which um, had people self-report on whether they thought they were good multitaskers in the office or not, and whether they thought things like having Facebook or um, social networking sites made them more or less productive. And there was one group who were adamant, oh, yes, I have all that stuff open and I'm sure I'm less productive. And another group said, no, I turn off all of that stuff. I'm a monotasker and I know I'm more productive. They took that data and compared it with who got raises, who got promotions from their bosses who said, this is the, mo this is the most valuable productive person in my firm versus that person. Well, it was the people who were sure they weren't productive because they were multitasking all the time who were the ones that got the raises. Those people that turned off everything and just wanted to do one task at a time were, in fact, the lowest people in terms of their um, rating within their firm of their contribution um, to the firm itself, to the corporation itself. And I think partly it's because we don't need to pay attention all the time. There are some instances where, yeah, we want to know whether we, there were 16 basketball tosses and many, many other things in life. All we want to do is be vaguely aware that people are tossing basketballs and we really want to also understand that there's a gorilla and wonder why did this gorilla come through? What was that about? And that ability to see um, pragmatically so that we're sometimes grabbing one kind of information, sometimes another, and we're able to synthesize a larger, pi larger picture is exactly the multitasking advantage that can't be measured in um, the kind of experiment that Cliff and that many psychologists set up. Um, 
but that is that is about seeing a bigger picture and being able to see synthetically and complexly in different situations at different times. Well, certainly there are times when I want to be fully focused and I uh, feel very productive getting something out. But I do, I really feel like I've experienced something of a personal cognitive revolution because of the internet where my brain is making all of these connections. And it reminds me of the sort of the old story of how innovation is people bringing a practice from one industry to another one. And it feels very much like that. I think you maybe even say that in the book. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, whenever I, I give talks um, or am working on, on change with institutions, I now do a lot of consulting with institutions that are going through change and help them see things better. But people say on a personal level, what should I be doing now to be effective in this multitasking world? And I always say the first thing you need to do is relax and um, just take a deep breath and don't think prescriptively anymore, but um, instead think more about what you need to be predictive, pr um, productive in your situation. In one situation, that means shutting out all externals and just concentrating on the task at hand. In another situation, it might be being in the most cacophonous, complicated, wild, inspiring situation. Um, one day it might be taking a walk in the woods. On another day it might be sitting and doing your work at a coffee house. But the key is learning what you find most productive for the particular task you're trying to do at a given, at a given time. One of the benefits for me of being an adult is that I feel as though I, I do kind of manage my own time and I'll have a flurry of productivity and then I'll have a period of time where just nothing's going to get me to do it and if I were having to sit at a desk it would be just a nightmare um, and I sense that uh, that as adults we figure out how to how to do that but we haven't given students the benefit of that option. Exactly and um, I love the work by um, people like Jonathan Schuler who will do this mean thing they said people tasks. They'll say, for the next five minutes, I want you to read these passages from War and Peace, and we're going to test you at the end. So it's the most anxiety-producing kind of thing. And then he will introduce, he will interrupt them at um, the third minute and say, tell me what you're thinking right now, right this second. And half the time, they're not thinking about War and Peace, even though they have a set amount of time. They have a test at the end. They're in the most anxiety-producing testing situation. Your mind still wanders. We're very, very poor at being able to keep our minds on one task for an extended time. And we're even poorer at remembering um, the time we're looking out the window, the six times we got up and got a glass of water in the course of doing our task, um, the fact that we sharpened pencils or looked at our Facebook page, which is sort of, sort of 21st century um, equivalent to sharpening your pencil. Those aren't important to our endeavors, so we don't even notice our own habits. Uh, what wonderful psychologists can do is track us and show that our eye movements are changing or our physical patterns are changing or our concentration is wavering. Um, it's not important in a larger world um, to be attentive all the time. And in fact, we need to take some cognitive breaks. Um, and it's only really when people are trying to say, are you a good multitasker and come up with extremely artificial situations um, that it even seems as if we're adhering to one task cognitively all the time. Um, one of my favorite examples is people walk across busy and even dangerous intersections talking, laughing, joking with friends all the time. If you see any camera at an intersection, you see this is the case. The first time the taxi cab bears down on you and five feet from you screeches on the brakes blows the horn, you can never walk across the street talking to somebody else again without being anxious. That's exactly one of those situations that you're multitasking. Walking, paying attention to traffic, talking is extremely difficult, far more than texting uh, a difficult cognitive task. And it's because you've been disrupted and you become aware of your pattern that you see that you're multitasking and actually multitasking in a dangerous situation. Um, it, you know, there's, there's real life uh, versions of that in just about everything we do. And in fact, one, people, one reason people like flow experiences like um, rock climbing without a, without a safety catch, or you just talked about skiing earlier, skiing is it's some of the very rare 
moments in our life when we are doing one thing and concentrating on that because if we don't, we're going to get in very, very big trouble. So well, I have, my nephew came over the other day and he said to me, you know, I, I feel like whenever I read, my mind just wanders. So I told him my secret for reading a book. I told him I never read a book in order. I look at the, I read the introduction, then I'll read the conclusion, then I'll look at the table of contents, and I, it would, I try within an hour to kind of get a sense of the larger argument of the book, to, to then decide where to, to read into it. And, and then I got to thinking, you know, we don't really tell students that, uh, that it's okay to cheat like that. It's, that. In fact, that's not even cheating, that our brains kind of want to observe information in a fashion that suits our interests and our levels. Um, have you noticed the same thing? Do you read a book serially? No, and in fact, oh my gosh, I'm going to have to hang up my, uh, <laughs> my diploma as a, an English teacher because actually I'm a notorious skipper. I, I read around in every book, and one reason I actually don't like reading very much on an iPad um, or on a Kindle is it's a very linear form of reading, and I just don't read that way. Um, I've actually been tested, in the course of writing this book, I was tested many, many times, and I've got an eccentric, uh, uh, grabbing way of reading. It's a, a version of photographic reading, and in fact, I can do a party trick of reading a student dissertation in an astonishing amount of time. and asking lots of complicated questions about it um, when I'm really um, reading in this, this grabbing way rather than a linear, linear way. Turns out almost all of us reading, there's no, no place in the brain for reading. People have only been reading for 10,000 years, so it's not an evolutionary feature of the brain, reading. And we read in very, very complex and different ways. We read in different ways, for example, if we've read a book before, if we know the plot, if we know the ending. Um, we read in a different way if we're going to be tested on it. We read in a different way if it's an instruction manual than a novel. There's um, so many, uh, if it's our first language versus our second language, all of those things happen in different ways. And they happen in different ways for us, um, even within our own lives. And again, we rarely are aware of our patterns, but we read People magazine differently than we read The New Yorker. Um, we read a magazine on a plane different than we read a magazine um, uh, sitting in a hammock on a on a beach, and again, we there's no real reason we have to be aware of our own patterns. But you're totally right. We don't usually tell students, yeah, you can skim. It's fine to skim. Um, there are hints for skimming, uh, and even when you don't think you're skimming, you actually are. Um, it's very very rare that you read every single word in a sentence. Um, Steven Pinkert's done lots of tests on this. Lots of linguists have done this, where they will substitute words in the so-called non-important part of a sentence. And, and you don't, it's almost like the gorilla. You don't even recognize that words have been substituted. That's so funny. There's a little bit of a, um, a funny thread going on in the chat because, like you, I don't like reading on the Kindle for anything other than fiction because I do read fiction linearly. linearly. But uh, Peggy George says she actually likes the Kindle because it allows her to skip around. Um, what, one of the things that occurred to me, and, and maybe it's somewhat mundane, but it was very interesting, you, know, you talk about attention and distraction, and then for me I kind of added this category of connection making that we're talking about, this uh, reading for making mental connections, um, um, you know, multitasking as a way of participating in connection making, and it occurred to me that uh, I often make those connections in the shower or when I'm driving, and it's almost as though that's the time when my brain kind of relaxes relaxes and goes into automatic mode, and, and those connections can surface. I think if you look at the history of inspiration, uh, scientific inspiration and uh, literary or artistic inspiration, you will find that your shower taking ideas are part of a very long and honorable tradition. Um, it's quite, and that's the distracted thing too, it's when you look away from your object of focus that you see what you were missing. You know, so it's precisely because you're not focusing on something else that something that, you know, you, it, you, you know the, the most common language phrase is that is, how did I miss that? Oh my gosh, it was staring me in the face and I never saw it before. Well, you never saw it before because you were looking very, very focused and, and hard at something else. So you missed the gorilla. It's a, it's, um, you know, the, I think, it, you know, there's so many stories. Niels Bohr getting on a trolley car. Uh, Einstein, there's so many stories, some of them apocryphal, about what is the moment of inspiration, but it's often a moment of 
uh, serendipity, uh, attentional serendipity, or att uh, where um, because you're not focusing on the detail, you suddenly are able to grasp, and to use your word connection, you're able to cr grasp underlying structures or larger um, overarching structures that you simply couldn't see. It's, uh, we have another cliche for that, the forest and the trees. If you're looking really hard at the trees, it's very hard to step back and see the forest, um, to see the connection of one tree to another, that it's, it's precisely that connection that makes that um, category of forest. So I want to uh, draw a couple of other uh, attention to a couple of other things before we move into maybe some of the kind of practical recommendations for thinking about education. But one of the things you talk about is building cognitive reserves, and I thought that was really interesting. Do you want to explain that? There, that's one of the, some of the, uh, you know, I, I, I've, I've been so honored at the attention this book has been receiving. At this point, I could probably give a talk, three talks a day from people who are in the midst of some kind of major change in their organization and who've um, read Now You See It or heard me talk and want to me to come and help think with them about um, educational and workplace and other change. But the one place... I'm baffled that I've gotten very very little attention is in the chapter on aging, which in some ways I think is the most optimistic chapter of all. And and one of the experiments I talk about in that in that chapter is the one about cognitive surplus, which basically says people who learn multiple and complex ancillary skills um, are able to um, when they've had strokes, for example, re rely on those other skills to compensate for actual physiological brain damage. Uh, the most obvious one, the most um, notable one, where the most research has been done, is on second language acquisition. Um, people who have strokes in language parts of the brain um, often are able to still rely on secondary um, language acquisition, um, so for example, if English is my first language, but I also learned French um, after infancy, let's say when I'm eight or nine years old, um, I might damage my brain and lose some of the ability to, sp to speak, read, talk, um, and understand in English, but might still have my abilities, in my cognitive abilities intact for, um, for, for processing the world in French. And um, that's one example, a purely physiological example of how cognitive surplus works. And I believe I tell the story of my friend Ichiro-san, uh, a Japanese friend who actually did suffer a stroke, and they thought he was talking gibberish in the ambulance as they were rushing him to the hospital. But fortunately, his son realized he wasn't talking gibberish. He was speaking French. And um, for several years after he was recovering his Japanese again, after his stroke, he could speak in French or in English um, and uh, had to you know, painstakingly relearn uh, Japanese again, but was able to converse quite fluidly in French and English. That's the most obvious neurological version of that. But there are many, many other ways where we have a cognitive surplus. Um, I think that's Clay Shirky that actually used that term, which is something, some bonus. Um, you use the phrase connection. Some bonus that comes from the multiple layering of different skills, including enabled by the internet, that allows us to crowdsource our abilities and um, gather from the information that's so rapidly avail available through search and browsing functions um, on the internet. And it's a very, very different way of, synthetic way of learning. Um, and one of the tragedies of the era we're in is here we are in the most rigid way of marking, learning, and assessing learning in all human history. The, the standardized test, which was invented in 1914 to deal with a teacher shortage, and uh, Frederick Kelly came up with the multiple choice test in order to um, come up with a way of grading students going through the higher education, I mean, the um, secondary education system in America that was based on the Model T. So we have this very, very rigid system of learning at the same time that outside of school, kids are learning in the most creative, synthetic, multifaceted, multitasking, cognitively uh, exuberant way possible. Um, and so we have a terrible, terrible mismatch between the national policy we have in this country which is based on standardized testing and the very, very fluid ways kids, and not just kids, all of us, 
are now learning online. I really enjoyed that chapter. Is you know, uh, probably no secret that I'm 50 years old, but it was attractive to me in part, you know, because of feeling like I fell into that category. Um, I also really. Uh, enjoyed sort of the theme throughout the book of the value of recognizing this attention blindness and so working to create environments for ourselves where we are with other people who are going to have different viewpoints and different ways of seeing things and uh, you know it made me think of my own marriage but also of work environments and I wondered about Google is, is Google just an anomaly or is there bringing uh, people of a certain intelligence level and ultimately likely to be problematic for them well, you know, it's interesting. Google did this incredible um, worker survey in the spring of this year called Project Oxygen, where they um, crunched, because they're data crunchers, all of the data from every one of their worker surveys. And this is hiring, firing, promotion, um, merit raises, non-merit raises, um, from, their, from their inception to the present. And here's a com company that's totally based on hiring the best technology people there are. And um, their adage is that you can't really be a manager of technologists unless you know that technology. Well, when they crunched their own data, they were pretty, pretty shaken up because it showed technology skills and technology acquisition didn't even make the top 10 um, in their own data of how they actually reward managers. And the things, um, the, the WAG who wrote this up in for the New York Times that it was like a post-it post notes on a bulletin board in an episode of The Office because the things that came in number one were kind of plays well with others, uh, good communicator, listens well, creative synthesizer of information, um, imaginative, you know, not anything about, uh, about tech skills. And um, when I talked at Google earlier this year, um, I talked to people in the management department who said they are actually changing their hiring practices because they are a data-driven company and their own data showed that actually data isn't the whole thing. Um, I also think the Steve Jobs lesson has weighed on everybody and it's changing everybody. You know, and Steve Jobs kept saying technology isn't enough, that you have to have arts and humanities too. And it was learning calligraphy that allowed him to create Apple products. Well, the world can't get enough of those beautiful Apple products. As, as frustrating and overpriced as they sometimes may be, they're gorgeous and they're wonderful and they interface with all the aspects of our lives. We're not just technologists. We are living, breathing human beings and there's kind of an app for all of that. And, um, you know, so I think that we live in a world that's becoming more integrated. And again, I do a lot of history in the book. The division of the world into the so-called two cultures with arts and humanities and social sciences on one side, and take on the other side, the other culture is technology and, ma and medicine and math. The world doesn't operate that way. And certainly the World Wide Web is about connecting all those aspects of our lives, personal, work, um, technology, everyday life, in really complex and fluid ways. And I'm convinced that more and more, um, especially as this generation um, comes of age, and they are coming of age now. We're, we're now getting college students who don't remember it before. Um, they don't remember a time before the Internet was in their, in their lives. And so I think they're looking more pragmatically at, at how this can work for me. And um, I think as we see, as we get further and further into this age, that two cultures division is going to have to go away. It doesn't work. It's not how we live our lives. So in a couple of minutes, we're going to switch to the Q&A portion of the show. But before we do so, I wanted to ask you about the audience for the book. Um, as I read the book, I thought, this is brilliant for me. I'm really engaged in the content. But I'm, I'm wondering if it will reach beyond the choir. So within the education world, are you seeing ways in which uh, this message can translate past those who are already sort of interested in the shift and in rethinking education, and how would we do that? Um, actually, I'm, I'm overwhelmed by how many people. First of all, it helps that everybody hates standardized testing. So once I come out so adamantly against standardized testing, I've not met a teacher, a student, a parent, an administrator. Even the assessment people don't like the form of testing we have now. It's a very impoverished for a very impoverished, expensive form of testing. So that helps me um, make friends. Um, I also do a version of the gorilla experiment whenever I talk to educators. And it's so shocking 
for them to be caught in their own assumptions that um, they're ve they tend to be very, very open to new ideas. Um, there's so much in common sense that sh says that our educational system does not serve the Internet age and the Internet generation, that people are really looking for solutions. Again, I could, I could spend 24 hours a day just talking to institutions that are in the midst of change. I think we're really at a liminal moment where things are happening. And I'm happy to talk about some of those um, um, practices. For one thing, uh, here's one example. Um, most universities are still based implicitly or explicitly on the lecture. There is no research, none, zero, I can say this categorically, that says the lecture is a good way to learn if what we mean by learning is memory, retention, ability to take ideas and translate them into other situations, or even being able to re reproduce with accuracy what we think we heard in the lecture. And this isn't a year later. This is 10 minutes after there are these great experiments where people will stand out in the hallway after people have been to a lecture that they love, like at TED Talks, and say, what did you hear? And ask people to just give a narrative of what they heard. They're really hearing some combination of the content of the lecture and their own personal interactions with that lecture material, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But if we think that that's teaching people a skill, we're just deluding ourselves. It doesn't work. That is not, Socrates was right that the lecture was impoverished. You really need interactivity. You need connection. You need dialogue. You need having an idea and trying to teach it to somebody else and being clear, being introspective about what you're learning when you teach and what you gloss over when you think you know something. As soon as you have to explain something, all these blind spots appear. And good teachers know that. Um, I can change any educator as long as they're a good educator. Um, I can make them flip from black to white as long as they're a good educator because a good educator is a lifelong learner. One of the lessons I took away from the book was very personal for me, which, which is if we begin to recognize the degree to which attention blindness is at the root of different perspectives, whether they're social, political, or educational, then that changes how we inter interact with others who disagree with us. Uh, and it was sort of a reminder to me of the degree to which it's very easy to quickly go to polar polarities but how valuable it is to try and create frames for people to understand a different perspective. Thank you so much for that. I, I, I think if there's one thing I believe in most strongly, that, that's it. In fact, this nonprofit that um, I and other people started in 2003 called Haystack, which is a horrible acronym that stands for Humanities, Art, Science, and Technology Advanced Collaboratory. We all just say Haystack. It's based on what we call collaboration by difference, and this is the basic founding principle of the World Wide Web applied to all forms of formal education too, and that's if you don't have enough different diverse perspectives on a problem, and this is what web developers, this is the Bible of web developers, you will, all, you will never catch the bugs. You will never find the viruses. The, the, the famous Eric Raymond statement on this is with enough eyeballs, all bugs are shallow, and that's a, a kind of a hilarious statement, but what it really means is if I'm a developer and you're a developer and we come from the same traditions and we're looking at a problem together and we're looking in the same way, we're not going to see the bugs. If some 16-year-old dropout, which is, you know, that's the story of Joey Ito, who's now head of the MIT Media Lab and who helped Tim Berners-Lee create, create the World Wide Web. Here's a 16-year-old dropout in Tokyo who starts seeing this thing, the World Wide Web being developed, um, HTML being developed and starts with no training at all, just a lot of brilliance, starts contributing code. And Tim Berners-Lee at first said, who are you? What are your credentials? And then realized it was the credentials that were preventing him from seeing his own solutions. And by working with somebody who had no credentials and who was Japanese, who comes from a totally different way of formulating how language works and how interactivity works, that together they made a great partnership and were able to create what is now the World Wide Web. And of course, that they were joined by hundreds of thousands of others um, who contribute to that process. And it's so important to say, well, that seems wrong, but maybe it isn't wrong. Maybe it's exactly right, and I'm not seeing what's going on here. Maybe I have to listen in a different way. Maybe I have to be disrupted from my habits in order to hear um, the message that I'm being told here, because that's the way we see the world more clearly.
So we're talking with Kathy Davidson about her book, Now You See It, and we have about 10 minutes left for Q&A. Uh, Kathy, we do finish the interviews on time as a courtesy to you, so we actually have nine minutes left. But if you have a question for Kathy, please feel free to raise your hand. That's the third icon over in the participant window. I can give you the microphone. Or you can put your question in the chat. If, if you've put a question in the chat and I didn't catch it, please feel free to post it again. So Kathy, while we're waiting for a question, uh, do you want to talk a little bit about your, the, you did two things at Duke that were really intriguing. I'm sure you've done many things, but one was the iPod program and the other was uh, your, this is your brand on the internet and how you graded that class. Are there either of those you'd want to talk about for a minute or two? Sure. The iPod experiment is exactly the opposite of dropping iPads in school, which is my pet peeve. Um, I hate thinking that you're going to change anything by taking the same old institution and just dropping technology into it. Uh, the interesting thing about the iPod experiment was we did it in 2003, and the iPod had barely been out, was out less than a year. There was no two-way communication. It was a music listening device. And what we did was we gave it free to first-year students, and then the second, third, and fourth-year students were ready to murder us. They were so mad that the first-year students got free iPods, and they didn't. And we said, oh, dear, we made a terrible mistake. How about this? You can get a free iPod if you come up with an educational use for the iPod. And if you can t convince a professor to change the syllabus to put the iPod into the syllabus. And within one semester, we got, oh, my gosh, we were on the cover of Newsweek. We were on NBC News. Everyone said we were charlatans. This was terrible. What a horrible thing we were doing. We were ruining education as we know it. Well. Within one semester, we gave away more free iPods to students who had come up with, not only come up with educational uses and some pretty amazing ones, like how to listen to the NIH um, uh, um, Museum of Heart Arrhythmias, a catalog of heart arrhythmias, and listen to somebody's own heart and help to diagnose a heart arrhythmia, um, and lots and lots of other really interesting things. We gave away more iPods for that that students had come up with. And they hadn't just come up with things, they convinced professors to change. Well, I think you should get a Nobel Prize for convincing a professor to change his syllabus. Um, it doesn't happen very often. But professors at that time were, were really starting to feel a little anxious about their own knowledge base and were willing to listen to the students and actually did make that change. To me, that innovation, not dumping iPods or iPads into the schools, but really challenging us to think in new ways and to think in new ways together and to change the hierarchy of who's the professor and who's the student. That students actually had professors change their ideas was huge and change their syllabus was huge. It was, a, to my mind, a great educational experiment. So Shelley has a question. She asks, how have you found your students' default setting settings as learners? Um, now who don't remember life before the internet have shifted over the course of your time working with them? Well, I mean, some of them are funny. Uh, to, you know, I, I, I really flip the classroom. I have my students change my syllabus. They leave the classes here each, each week. They do all kinds of interesting experiments. And a couple of them, years ago, one of my students made an a, a assignment for his other students of having them write a paper where they didn't use any technology invented after 1993. And it was hilarious because the students came in saying, Oh, this thing, this typewriter thing. How in the world did anyone ever have an idea when on a typewriter? I mean, you type something and you have a mistake and you have to retype the page. I mean, that's crazy. You know, so the default setting is not even being able to conceive of a world um, without the technologies, the instant search kinds of technologies of the present. So digital literacy is something I emphasize a lot as opposed to digital proficiency. In other words, you can use technology very rapidly and successfully without really thinking about security or safety or what search is. What is how is Google manipulating search? What information is Google getting about you from your, search from your own searches? How are they data mining you? All of those kinds of issues um, uh, that we have to, just because you do technology well does not mean you understand what you're doing with that technology. Um, how did you change the grading in that class? I uh, do a pretty funny thing. I mean, my, first of all, we use basic contract grading. So, you know, you get an A if you satisfactorily complete, 
10 assignments or a B if you have 8 assignments or a C if you have 6 assignments. So that's specified and you do, we do a signed contract. But the key is satisfactorily is not defined by me, the teacher. It's defined by the two students who that week are in charge of teaching the class. The following week, those students are back in the class as students and somebody else is doing the grading. But whatever the assignment is that these students set, they're also responsible for grading that assignment and determining whether the students have satisfactorily completed the grade. That's partly because my classes aren't just about content, but about the form and the form of, again, to go back to your word, connection. Um, on the internet, anybody can post anything. I have an idea, I post the idea. Anyone else can comment on that idea. But how we give feedback in a structured, clear, thoughtful way is not a skill we teach very often. Um, and so part of what I do in that crowdsourced grading is I'm teaching people how to be responsible in giving feedback and how to be responsible in setting the standards for themselves and one another in a, in a group where the group project is to learn together. Is there any lesson we could learn from gaming with regard to achievement levels and grading? I mean, it seems as though uh, um, Alice Keeler talks about this, which is uh, that in gaming you achieve a certain level and you move from level to level. In education, we often will skip levels and give bad grades, but you don't actually go from level to level. Uh, does, your, does your system do that, or can you think of ways that we, we could move toward that kind of achievement level? system or yes, book? I think I think um, for me it's not about video games it's about the structure of games which is the structure of failure um, in games you learn from what you don't do well and you learn constantly from somebody else who does what you does your task better than you are or if you're just playing against yourself you fail a little bit and and it's not failing it's oh I didn't get that right how can I get that right to me that's the way we should be teaching everything not in terms of you know, something as mechanical as learning by video games, but constantly learning from our own failure, from our own mistakes, from our own risk taking. I don't believe you can be imaginative and innovative unless you're willing to challenge yourself to do the thing you can't do, not the thing you know you can do. And interestingly, when I talk to management trainers, um, the people who are responsible for hiring new people into a corporation and, um, and training them, they always say that Really, really smart students take a good year to two years to stop being people who do well on tests or do well for the approval of teaching of their teachers and learn how to take risks. And most important, how to learn what they don't know. Because in the business world, in the adult world, what you have to know is, I don't know how to do this, so I have to figure out how I can learn that. That's almost the opposite of the way we teach students, which is really sort of learning to cover up what you really don't know well. It's really a pity. It's a shame. We, learn, we teach people how to hide their ignorance rather than to solve it and to find other people that can help us to solve our own shortcomings or the things that we need to know to succeed but don't have currently at hand. Cassie, I really want to thank you for coming on the show. I'm using the clapping icon, which is now somewhat hidden in this new version of Blackboard Collaborate. But if you look for the smiley face and go down, you can clap. Some of you are raising your hands, which is equivalent to clapping at this moment, so thank you very much. The book is Now You See It, How the Brain Science of Attention Will Transform the Way We Live, Work, and Learn. And our guest has been Kathy Davidson. Kathy, thank you so much. That was really delightful. Thank you so much. I had a great time. Those were great questions. And I don't see the icon for clapping, but let me clap back to the, all the people that were online. It was really fabulous. And I love um, paying partly attention to our conversation, Steve, and partly to the, to the great chat that was happening online. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kathy. Coming up on the Future of Education on Thursday, David Warlick. Next week, Alec Koros and Gail. If you want to right now, you can actually save the chat. You go up to File, Save, and Save the Chat. The chat is also available in the full Illuminate recording, both to watch replay, but also to save it if you would like to do so at the time. Thanks to all of you for attending. Thanks to Kathy so much for being on the show. Uh, we'll look forward to having you back again at some point. Um, if you are able to, as soon as you're done, please do exit the room so the recording can process. Thanks, everybody, and have a great night or day.